On this episode of Inside Boxing Live, we're going to bust some myths. There are a lot of myths in the boxing world, and we're here to bust them. Canelo Alvarez has announced his plans. He ain't taking, uh, he's coming back, says Canelo Alvarez. Shamonta Davis says he's back. I went to UFC 281. Chris was in Cleveland. We'll talk about all that and more on this edition of Inside Boxing Live. What is up, everybody? Welcome into another edition of Inside Boxing Live, a product of John Boy Media. I am Dan Canobio, coming to you from our warehouse in Jersey City. Chris Algieri from sunny Florida. Ronnie Jerez, our super producer, is here as well. And Chris, how are you, my friend? You were in Cleveland. You were on the road. You were calling the fights. The three-piece suit looked tremendous. How's everything going? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it was good. It was a good weekend, but I am glad to be back. It was, it touched the thirties in, uh, in Cleveland. And uh, listen, I don't like anything with a five in front of it. Once it hits 50 degrees, I need to get back to Florida. I heard it was dicey in Cleveland. The shackle texted me. There was a big brawl. The way in he said was a little, a little strange like Cleveland. I've been, I've covered a fight in Cleveland at the Arnold classic. It, it's an interesting place. I heard it did get a little dicey though. There was some big brawls in the crowd. Well, I got contact high while I was calling the fight, so there's that. Um, but other than that, I mean, I stayed away. I don't go to Wayans because nothing good happens at Wayans from from a commentator's point of view. There's nothing for me to really learn from those, so I don't even go to them. But, uh, yeah, I, I figured that would probably not be the safest place to be. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, what was going on in, in uh, Detroit this past weekend. Uh, there were some big fights all across uh, the country. Um, I was at UFC 281. Um, UFC Dan was in the house. MMA Dan was in the house. Uh, casual, casual MMA fan Dan. Casual MMA appreciator Dan Carobio. Uh, I'm having fun with it, man. I, you know what? Like I've always loved MMA. Uh, I've called MMA for like ten years now. That's like something that people don't know. Like my brother owns a uh, runs a promotion out on Long Island called Flex Fight Series. So I've been around MMA. I know I had this bit where I'm a casual fan and, and it's fun, but. UFC 281, I uh, had I was very lucky to get a suite with my brother and the MMA Island guys. And, man, that was a card and a half. Um, obviously, Izzy Adesanya gets upset. Uh, Chandler Poirier gave us a fight for the ages. Uh, Frankie Edgar got vaporized. That was sad. Um, it was an awesome experience, man. It, it was it was pretty cool to kind of pick up the culture there. And, and I was just, like, kind of taking it all in. You know, fans get there super early. Uh, which was nice to see, you know, they're in their seats at like 8 p.m. watching the prelims, uh, you know, rooting for, you know, fan favorites, like whether it's Dan Hooker, whether it's Poirier and Chandler. Uh, it was an awesome night. I, I, I'm a, I, I'm full blown in on board for UFC. I can't wait for the next one. UFC is really smart because they were kept out of New York and kept out of MSG for like two decades. And there was a big backlash against bringing them in. And once they finally got in, they've made it a, a point that every single card they do at MSG, and it's normally in this fall time, they stack them. They stack them with the best fights, the most popular fighters. Dan Hooker opened the main card. Like, he's <laughs> he's actually awesome. Super fun to watch. One of my favorite guys to actually watch. I think he's fantastic, even though he's been on a, a bit of a slide lately. Um, Poirier and, and Chandler is a fight that has been in – whispering for 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 months now and awesome that that finally happened and that was a non a, a non-miss that you couldn't you're not going to have a not a classic in that fight um the main event was for people who know especially if you know who put head is that fight was big and, and you look at his record he's only six and one he's fighting izzy and izzy's like one of the most dominant champions we've seen in a long time you're like you're not giving him a shot but anyone who's ever seen him kickbox and actually saw their first fight you knew that was a that was a, an awesome awesome matchup, and there was a potential for an upset. I actually thought that Izzy was going to squeak it out, but and he almost did. But Pujera, it's just man, he's got that eraser. Yeah, like I could break down a fight, you could break down a fight. And what I saw in the first round, at the end of the first round, Izzy had him rocked, and yep. I thought, why didn't he go after him at the beginning of the second? He let Pereira kind of recover. I also know that he was a little skeptical of what was going to come back because Pereira has those those hands and he came in at like 215 that was a straight up heavy. i was gonna say and he's fucking huge he like, is a he's big so big dude man so but all, big. All, all in all great night poor a chandler was insane like the like 
that mixed every part of MMA. Like they stood and boxed for a round. They got took it to the ground. Uh, there was a little bit of everything. Uh, so I, I love that. And, um, you know, the crowd was really into it. Like you said, like Dan Hooker seems like he's like a fan favorite. That's one thing I really like about the culture is like people were just rooting for fighters that they know have given them good nights in the past. So like, Dan's lost like four of his last five. People right? still love him. And he's from what? Australia. Um, so far from New York. Doesn't have a fan base in New York, but he has a he has given fans great nights in the past, and the fans are appreciative of that. So they're pulling for him in that fight. His opponent like didn't even want to engage. He was like laying on the mat the whole time. It was like almost like a DQ. Um, all in all, great night at the fights. A fight's a fight. There's a cage. There's a ring. I get hyped for it, and and I'm gonna be covering or following along. I tweeted out things I like about MMA and things I don't like, which got people very very riled up. Uh, I like best versus best. I like the rankings in the UFC, like you know, like Meatball Molly, who was one of the big got the biggest pops of the night. You know, she's obviously one of like the most popular people or fighters in the UFC, and they put her in there with a very tough opponent, and she got choked out within like three minutes. It's like if that was boxing, they would have. You know, not to compare the two, but they would have had her go against, you know, built her up because she's an entity. Uh, I, but I like that. I like the rankings, like consistency, like that losses don't matter. Um, full, like I said, f- fans in the seats for the full card. Um, what I don't like is the fighter pay, obviously. I don't like that they wear uniforms, like Chris. Like he, boxers, I feel like any fighter should be able to express themselves. I don't like those Venom uniforms. Look good, feel good, fight good. That's a big part of, of being a, a professional boxer. Going from the amateur ranks where you have to wear a uniform, which I understand, especially if you're going to the Olympic level. But once you're a pro and you have that 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 freedom to dress the way you want and, and make your personal style your own, that makes a big difference. And for fighters, you need that because essentially we're naked out there in front of millions of people. And if you have any kind of flair that you can you can make yourself stand out and signify who you are, I think is really important. I mean, I've always worn my, my, my family's flags and crests and colors. And that, that's important to me. You know, I have my, the Argentinian flag for my mother, I have the Italian flag for my father. You know, if there is something that uh, I want to promote, if there's, you know, someone who passed away, like those are the kind of things that fighters and, and boxers like to put on their bodies. And I think that's an important part of the sport. So yeah, I agree with you that MMA is missing the boat on that one. I mean, they do let them come walk out with the flags. Like that's a big big part of it like the yeah. walkouts were kind of tame like i was expecting a little more theatrics um i don't know if msg really allows for that because it's kind of like a weird entrance at msg like they've always it's always been like that even like the wwe is there they don't really have like the big elaborate walkout but these are little nitpicking things all in all the fights were really fun ronnie you're kind of an mma guy right yeah actually i'm an mma guy before being a boxing guy Okay. All right. Not that yeah. this is an MMA pod, but I mean, it was a fun night. Like it was interesting yeah. to kind of just take it all in and like pick up. I'm so entrenched in boxing. I'm always going to be boxing my number one sport. And of course, I'm sure the same way you're the same way, but it is a fight. And I wanted to kind of just take it all in and figure out like the culture. And I'm, I, you know, I'm starting to learn a little bit more about the culture of it. And it's just like the fans appreciate these guys. They appreciate what you, uh, you know, you fighters, what you guys do. And not that boxing fans don't, but it's, it's just completely different. Uh, type of culture but that was my ufc experience and i'm already looking forward to the next big one um let's get into some of the news uh, let's talk about janabek um he fought on espn against denzel bentley the hype train around this guy was immense uh, i feel like top rank and espn are trying to like copy the triple g hype train uh but not everyone's triple g right chris not everyone can be gennady golovkin steamrolling guys um and he got a decision win it was a Decent performance, but the hype that they were giving this guy did not allow him any room for error in a fight where he did perform well, but he just simply did not knock out Bentley, whatever, which everyone thought he was going to do. So I'll ask you, Chris, Janabek, where are you standing on him? Overrated, properly rated, bad night at the office. What are we going with here? Well, coming into the fight, I was as hyped as anyone else for Janabek. I've called a bunch of his fights when he was fighting throughout the uh, the pandemic and in the bubble. I mean, and he looked awesome. His his uh, ability to read guys and finish guys was it was awesome. It looked triple G esque. You know, he did it differently. Obviously, he's not like a a come forward, smash you up kind of guy, but like he did it in, a, in with a with a, a boxing flair to it. Uh, also being a southpaw, but. Yeah, man, he he did not have a good night on Saturday, and I'd like to chalk it up just to that, an off night against an awkward, strong guy. 
you know, there's something to say about that. Both of those guys, Janibek's a herky jerky kind of awkward off rhythm type guy. So is Bentley. Just Bentley is a lot less smooth and you know, he's, he's, he's kind of janky in the way he moves, but you can tell he can punch. He's strong. So it was a tough style. You know, do, do we, do we just market to that? Um, or is, you know, is he overhyped? I like to think that he just had an off night, which we are allowed to have. Uh, unfortunately, when you've got a lot of hype behind you, you're not allowed to have those nights. But I think that Janabek does have the goods. He definitely showed some holes. He's not a combination puncher. He's kind of just a one-two kind of guy, sets up his shots. And he didn't show the one-punch power that he's shown in the past. So, again, it could be an off night. It could be that we overhyped him. But only time will tell. But you, you can't you can't give a guy a grade of his whole career based on one one night. Yeah, I mean, he landed 47% of his power shots, um, throws 50 punches around, so it, it's he's not Triple G. Triple G's throws 75, 80, um, which, you know, that I think that's just ESPN top rank and doing their thing and, and really getting it behind the guy. Middleweight is barren wasteland. Um, there's no one at the weight besides him and Munguia. Munguia is fighting this weekend against another no-name guy, a no-hoper. So, Coria, uh, who, at, who Janabek iced. Put yeah. like put him away through the bottom rope. So, uh, what a stupid fight that is. But anyway, yeah, that's just Munguia's whole career. You can spend an entire show trying to figure out what the hell's going on behind me, Munguia's career. But that's a fight that I would like to see is Janabek uh, versus Munguia. But yeah, I, I would say like you know he he was putting the jab out there. Um, he was putting it together for the first five rounds, and then that's when Bentley from the fifth round out started to counter him and started. He could be hit, Janabek. I think uh, it, yeah, like, the hype. Like, once again, the hype allowed him very small room for error. And I th- I hate to use the word exposed. And later on in the show, we're going to talk about myths. And we're going to talk about some of these these triggering words in, in boxing. But not exposed. We just got to see him a little bit more. Because, for, you know, we hadn't heard, really heard of him until a couple fights ago. And obviously, his last fight was a massive highlight reel knockout on ESPN. This one was supposed to be the same. So when he goes 12... You know, you have these questions, and uh, that's fine. And we'll you see. Know, you, 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 you said he's hittable, but I don't. I haven't really seen that much in the past. I, I thought fight, he came out in particular, right? Yeah, he he didn't he he didn't fight like himself, as far as I'm concerned. I, I've called a bunch of his fights. I called a fight with Rob Brandt, where he looked spectacular. Um, you know, he beat Hassan Endam, who's listen, his career has been very long. He's taken a lot of damage, but still, getting him out of there is important. Um, you know, he's had a couple of highlight real knockouts recently. People, you know, he he had a lot of good performances in a row. And something that I always liked about him is one, he's ultra confident. He comes out, he's smiling, he's having a good time, he's pushing, pulling in and out. He didn't have that at all in this fight. And from the opening bell, I'm not sure if something happened in camp. I'm not sure if it was something that he felt from Bentley. But he did not come out like his normal confident self. And you could see, you know, like he didn't have that in and out. He didn't have that fluidity. He didn't have that ability to make Bentley miss and reach like he normally has. And that made this fight a fight. I don't think it was a very competitive fight. It was it was fun to watch. I, you know, Janabek won fight pretty wide, but he got hit. And that's where people are coming in. Like, well, I should knock this guy out. And then it became a fight. Right. They're trying to, to market him as the boogeyman. Um Yeah. But if the boogeyman gets tagged a few times, who knows? Maybe this like opens up him. Uh, other opponents want to step in with him. Uh, like I said, middleweight isn't really great right now. So that was over on ESPN. But, you were in. We got final remark. Here. I was going to say sometimes bad performance is good for your career. A lot of a lot of my best my best opportunities came off bad performances. So right. they're, they're always light at the end of the tunnel. There was like that old rumor that Triple G did that, you know, uh, where he stood in the pocket more. And let oh, Kel I'm sick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let Kel Brook kind of tee off on him a little bit for the first time. Yeah. We saw that. And then, you know, that's when Golovkin, he got the fight after that uh, with with Canelo. I don't know. Canelo, yep. fighters are, I don't know if Janibek is at that level where he has to do that, but we'll keep an eye on him uh, at, at 160. You were in Cleveland. Uh, the Montana, Montana love debacle. Um, WWE Royal Rumble. Uh, you got a little bit of that, you know, dr- dropping sparks or spark, I should say, out of the of the ring, disqualified. Uh, yeah, simple. I'll just ask you, did, did you think it should have been a disqualification? I think there is every right for it to be a disqualification. Uh, but at the same time, I also think that the fight should have gone on. You know, if, if that makes sense, uh, I, I understand where the ref was coming from. And we were talking about this and in hindsight, looking back on it. Initially, I was like, oh, man, I mean, as soon as they announced it, the disqualification, I'm like, oh, well, you know, he 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 got disqualified. And then we watched a couple more times. And I'm like, well, a little arguable. And now in hindsight, going back and watching it, I understand where the ref came from, because I believe once the ref grabbed Montana Love, 
and then Montana gave him that extra forearm over the top. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the ref was like, hey, listen, I touched you. I said break. You didn't respond. So you're disqualified, which is a, you know, it's a pretty harsh ruling, um, especially since Spark did a beautiful somersault land on his feet <laughs> outside the ring. That was, her. that was impressive. Um, but he, you know, he Spark probably would have fought on no problem. He didn't look like he threw his hands up like, oh, man, come on. But he also won't walk back to the ring. He was like, I can still fight. Um, I would have loved to see that fight keep going because it was actually just brewing and starting to be a really good fight. And I I've been saying it all week. Spark had a good chance to win that fight. And I thought he was on his way to, to, to winning that fight, probably by knockout. I like this guy, Spark. He's someone, after watching this fight, I want to see fight again. I like his fighting style. Comes forward, very aggressive. I don't know if I could say the same from Montana Love. Uh, obviously, he benefited from being on that Jake Paul uh, card uh, last year. And then he kind of like got that deal with Matchroom. And that's good. Great for him. Um, you know, people out there saying they was looking for a way out. He was getting a little touched. He was getting touched up. Got dropped. Uh, got cut. Fighting in his hometown, looking for, you know, would we'll never be able to figure out if he was looking for a way out. But, you know, we've seen it in the uh, past. We've seen it in the he, past. If a fighter gets, you know, frustrated, they they turn to some dirty tactics. You know, Mike Tyson, most notably, biting on ears, trying to break he, he, up his arm. He said he said the way out word. I can't see. That's the quiet quitting of boxing. If you ever say that you can't see, it's a myth. He, the fight's over and you don't want to fight. You can never say that. Even if you can't see, if you and you want to fight, listen. I, and, I, and I've had fights where my eyes were shut and I couldn't see, but I still told the doctor, "Nope, I can see. I'm good." Because I know if you say you can't see, watching boxing as long as I have, anytime a guy in a corner says, "I remember watching ESPN days," and a guy like, "I, I can't see." Fight's over. Fight's over. If you can't yeah. see, fight's that's, over. That's the word. That's the word. That that is the quiet quitting of boxing. If you say you can't see, the fight's going to end, and it has to because if you can't see, you can't defend yourself. Can't defend yourself. You're you're in a dangerous position in this sport. What was it, Gotti way back uh, against Rodriguez, where his eye was shut and they were tapped? Ryan, this is a great story. Arturo mm -hmm. Gotti, blood and guts warrior, the guy. Right. Um, eye shut in trouble in the corner. The the doctor comes over and says, "How many fingers am I holding up?" Guy, be his corner guy. He's tapping his back to let him know how many fingers he's holding up, dude. And then he gets back in and wins the fight in a Toro Gotti <laughs> fashion. Like that's legendary. But like, he couldn't see the fingers. Couldn't see the fingers at all. I was shut, just like Chris's was against uh, Provodnikov. Did they? They had to come over to you at one point and and ask for, for that same thing. Every round from round six on, they they came to the corner because they they told me they were going to stop it going into the fifth, and I was like, no, 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 give me one more round. They gave me one more round of, <laughs> through the twelve, but uh, yeah, so I so I couldn't see in the corner because every round it would swell, and then we'd be in the corner and we would ice it down and use the end swell to push the blood out of the area of where I'm, you know, can see through the eye. But by the end of the round, it would swell back up because it's just a matter of time while your heart's pumping. You know that that damaged tissue is going to fill up, so. Toward those later, Google. Oh yeah, toward toward those later rounds, I, I really couldn't see. And the doctor would come over, and they would say, "How many fingers am I holding up?" And whether I could, because they make you cover your good eye, yeah. and you got to go through your swollen eye. How many oh. fingers am I holding up? Little little trick for the guys at home: always say two. Yeah, because they don't go one first, right? They never go one. The the, go. the the doctors don't ask for one. That's they go insane. two because because if, if you got if you got you know well if you if you got double vision maybe then that'll tell them something, but. They always go too. So I always say it too. Myth busted. Myth, well, yeah, we got some myths coming up too. But I do want to. Um, last week, obviously, a lot of fighter safety. Now that we're talking about, you know, eye injuries and and, and whatnot. Um, obviously, our last episode was on Ados Yerbosanelli. Um, there are reports out there. Uh, that he is out of the medically induced coma, and I can confirm those reports. He's out of the coma, making significant progress. Next stop is a rehab facility. Uh, so that is good news. On uh, your boss and Nully. Don't know if he's ever going to fight again. Not even thinking about that. I don't think his family's thinking about it. I don't think his promoter's thinking about that. But that is good news to see that he's out of the coma and uh, he's on his way um, to, I wouldn't, I don't know, making a full recovery, but we don't know what his quality of life is going to be from here on out. But significant progress is made on the Eidos Yobasanelli front. Thank God. That's great. That's great news. Yeah, so that's that. Obviously, if you haven't saw our last episode, uh, was all about fighter safety. A little disappointed, but not surprised at the lack of conversation around it. Um, didn't see any of the big guys in the me boxing media really talking about it. Kind of, 
except us, of course, because we're always going to hit those topics. But no one really, you know, following up. No one really talking about it. You know, I know Lou DiBella. I called him and talked to him, and he was upset. Uh, but you know, it, it is what it is. Like you know, like we said last show, like not not everyone wants to talk about it because they just don't know how to, or they just want to sweep it under the rug. But we'll keep you updated on that. Uh, as we get more information, what else is going on in the boxing world before we get to our myth busting? Canelo Alvarez, Chris, says he'll be back in May. I am not taking a full year off. Coming back in May, coming off of hand surgery, he says, I want a tune up in May, and then I want Bivol in September at 175. This is what I want for my career. And what we've known from Canelo Alvarez is when he has a plan, he goes through with it. And as we know with Canelo Alvarez as well, is when he has a plan, they are everyone else gets in line. Uh, whether you're a 160 pounder, 168, 175, the other promoters trying to figure out what they want to do on that date. There is so much ramifications just from this guy's plans. So first off, let's think about who he could fight as a quote unquote tune up. Um, I would like to see John Ryder. What are your thoughts? Or the Ryder Parker uh- winner. Ryder Parker makes sense. Um, we spoke about this off air. John Ryder's a, a tough, tough tune-up, though. He, he's not an easy guy to fight stylistically. Um, you know, the fight would be at sixty-eight, which is probably good because Ryder's got to move up. He's a, he's a, a small guy for for those weights, but um, not 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 an easy guy. He's tough. He's solid. He's he's scrappy. Um, Zach Parker probably an easier easier fight for um, Canelo, although I haven't really seen that much of him. And uh, well, that, Parker's that Ryder. fighting Ryder, so right that Ryder fight will be very winner, telling. Yeah, the winner that comes out of that is probably in the driver's seat. But those are the level of guys that I would uh, expect for a tune up for a guy like Canelo, because Canelo tune ups are usually pretty damn good fighters. Um, but I mean, we'll see. I, I do I do not like the Bivol. <laughs> Bivol Canelo in September, man. We talked I mean, about I think, it a lot. I, uh, he needs to leave that alone. He needs to leave Not that fight alone. But... I mean, this guy's no. Nuts. I get it. I get it. He's Mexican and he's he, he's got pride. He's got cojones. Like he he. I get it. I get it. But uh, I don't know, man. That's a that's a that's a that's a tall mountain to climb. Ryder, um, say Ryder gets through this. Canelo has talked about wanting to fight in the UK. I think he's still aligned with Matchroom. Um, Good idea. There's a fight right there in the UK, uh, it, Cinco de Mayo, but it's not going to, I mean, that's not something they celebrate in, in, in England, but Canelo has talked about yeah, they'll, they'll take it on though. It's, it's a boxing weekend. It, that, that's a boxing, like, you know, as much as it's a, it's, it's a Mexican independence and it's, it's a boxing weekend too, man. And across the world, you know, the English, the British, the UK, yeah. the European fans are awesome. Well, and the, they will, I believe they would, they will take that on. And yeah, the boxing be, they make us. I think it's September. I think yeah. Mexican Cinco de Mayo is not even really like a holiday for Mexicans. It's kind of like a made up thing where us gringos go out and put a hat on and drink some some margaritas. I believe it's a, a and watch fights. It, it, it's a day to uh, commemorate a winning of a, a war. Not, I don't know or a battle. Okay. Um, yeah, but it's like not that. it's not independence. Day. It's a battle though. It's a battle in the ring. Oh yeah, excuse me. I don't I, I, I don't know what else to talk about there. But uh, right. no, yeah, the, this, the, this is not this is not a History Channel, guys. It's right. Not history September is the, not the independence. <laughs> I well, boxing from boxing. I learned that straight up from boxing that the September weekend is Mexican Independence Weekend. Yes. That's the bigger one. Yes. Uh, he'll be back for that. But that's the big one where he, want, where he wants to fight Bivol. Um, in May, I I would like me personally like to see the Parker Ryder winner. Um, because it's still. Decent fights, not really a tune up, and you could put it in the UK where he said he's always wanted to fight. You could put it at Wembley, and he will easily get, you know, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand there because they've never seen the guy fight before. It would be an awesome yeah. spectacle. Um, but also, I think that's a good move, man. Yeah, that, that's a that's a good move. We'll see what he does. It's interesting to see what he does, and 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 what he always his plans are interesting on for all of boxing, like like I said, but there are some ramifications. So if, if he says he's going to fight B-Ball, B-Ball has said he really is not interested in it. Um, that could maybe change if he sees the check coming his way for that. So if he says he's going to fight, if Better be is fighting in January against Yard, uh, now this means that Bivol versus Better be might not happen in 2023 if Canelo does fight Bivol in September. That, so that is kind of a bummer. Um I don't actually think that fight's going to happen anyway, Bivol, better be a, but that's just kind of the fallout. uh, It's a shame. You know, it's kind of weird. Like, a small part of me was kind of hoping that Canelo wouldn't fight until September because, like, things will happen in the sport. Like, 
plant Benavides is happening because they, they didn't know if Canelo was definitely coming back or not. Or like, we'll see who someone else can get that date in, in, in May or other fights could shake out. Like, I obviously love watching Canelo fight, but like, maybe if he sat out, like, just for one of those slots, so many other things would happen in the sport that Canelo kind of prevents just from being such a big star. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's Canelo. He's he's so big. He has his own gravitational pull. So whatever he does or doesn't do affects the whole rest of the <laughs> the orbit of boxing because everyone ha- is is trying to get that fight. You know, when you are the golden ticket, the way Canelo is, he's the golden boy and the golden ticket at the same time, which generally is how it always goes, right? You had yeah. Sugar Ray Leonard. Everybody wanted to fight him. <laughs> you didn't really want to fight him because he was a killer, but that's where you get paid the most. Same thing with Oscar De La Hoya. When he was in his heyday and he was the golden boy, everybody wanted that fight because that was the biggest draw, the biggest money that you could make. And Canelo has has stepped into that that position now, and everything moves around him. Like you said, the entire sport moves around him, I, and and for good reason. He he, it's all about the numbers. It's all about the butts and seats, and that guy pulls. Yeah. Um. Last headline: Javante Davis says he's coming back in January. Uh, he didn't delete this tweet. He's known for deleting his tweets right after he sends them. Um, January in D.C. Um, Ryan Garcia and Javante Davis are not fighting in D.C. Uh, so that right there is a little. Yeah. Uh, no we can go to it. Um, that's kind of cool. It's on the East Coast. I would definitely go to that. Um, Amtrak. Amtrak. Maybe we hop on the Amtrak. We go watch Javante Davis versus who knows who. <laughs> because that is a big time storyline boxing is his resume and. Who's he going to fight? There's a lot of names out there. Honestly, don't really want to get into too much Jonathan Davis right now because we need to talk about our sponsor on this show. It is a fun one this week. It is Match 5 Trivia Game. Do great minds think alike? We're going to find out right here. We're actually going to play a little Match 5 right now. Uh, match 5 Trivia Game is a match your game. Oh, no, that doesn't make sense. Match answers with family and friends. Uh, over 320 game cards that cover a variety of topics. It's guaranteed fun for all the ages, especially with the holidays coming up, Thanksgiving. You don't like your family. You do like your family. Play some match game trivia. It creates fun discussions, friendly disagreements, fist fights. Who knows? It's perfect for the holidays. Like I said, vacations are anytime you're ready to have some fun. So we're going to play some match game trivia right now. And I have the perfect card that I pulled out here. And it is name five words or phrases that are synonymous with a fight. Got that, Chris. Don't say them out loud, though. Okay. <laughs> so Ronnie is playing as well. We're going to be playing according to you. Yes, I'm the host All right. with the most. So I'm going to put my five phrases down that are synonymous with a fight. You guys have to match as many as you can to my fight. Uh there we go. I, I got see the first one. Hey, 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 you're looking, looking at my it. phone now? I have one word that I know you're not going to put in there. What is it? It's got to be some like Spanish you. word? No, no, it's not. Um, there we go. Uh, God. Oh, man. I got three. I, I need two more. Um, this reminds you of your adjunct professor job right here. We're like <laughs> We're doing a pop quiz. I just uh, I just gave my students a pop quiz last week. They weren't very happy about it. Oh no, you're one of those professors. Uh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Um, uh, oh, I got a good one. Chris, how you doing over there? Uh-huh. What are we? I'm good. I got mine. You got five. Yeah. How do we do this? What? 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 Wait, what's, I'm waiting yeah. on my. I'm wait, I'm the host. I'm. I need one yeah, more. I, um, I only have two. I no, I, I got. I got. I got six. But you know um, me. I always like that. I always like that extra one. Yeah, you're an honorable mention guy. All right, here we go. Mm-hmm. Ronnie? Give me 10 seconds. Pencils down? <laughs> no, nah, give me 10 <laughs> seconds. Um, you're lucky and I'm not your professor. You'd be you'd be losing points already. Here we go. Here we go. Someone right. on Twitter just, uh, I put out who should Canelo fight and a picture of Chavez Jr. <laughs> <laughs> I said we didn't mention back. my boy Demetrius Andre. I, that's that's my dude. No, I know I know nobody wants to see that fight, but I just don't think Canelo uh, will do it. I think he's going. No, nah, he, he, def- he definitely won't. Yeah, All I right. get it because it's, it's not going to sell. But. Yeah. All right, let's do it. We're good. Yeah. All right, here we go. Five words or phrases synonymous with a fight. Uh, I got Donnie Brook. No. <laughs> okay. Good old Donnie. That's a really bad start. All right. No one has that. <laughs> Hustle. Hustle. Good one, but no, I don't have that one. Oh. No, I don't have 
Scrap? I got scrapping. Yeah, scrap. Yeah, scrap. I don't have that. A brouhaha. Oh, come on. Oh, good one. <laughs> good old fashioned brouhaha. And then I got a, a, a war. So oh, I was going to say that, but I thought it'd be too, like, you know, oh, yeah. it's a, it's I mean, a tough it, word. It, it, it is a tough word. There's then, a lot of wars going on right now. No but disrespect, but I feel like my, one, one I, match. I feel like my list is better than yours. What's your I'm, list? No, but we're going to go with Chris first. Chris, what's yours list? Um, I got, I had scrap. I had fisticuffs. Oh, I had oh, I had good. fisticuffs. Nice. Okay. Uh, pugilism. Whoa. Went a little oh, old school. Nice. What is that? Over old. Yeah. Throw hands. Like the throw uh, hands. Okay. It is a phrase that yeah. works. Yeah. It's not just a word. And then I, there's a phrase that's just to me is synonymous with fighting. Let's get rid of rumble. I I also had rumble. Rumble. Let's get rid of rumble. You, you just got sued. Um, you're not allowed to say that. So okay, rumble. Yes. Rumble, young man, rumble. rumble. Young man, rumble. <laughs> I don't Some think people. I don't think Ali can sue me. No, I match with Chris better than I match with you. Yeah, I don't know who won, but it wasn't me. You didn't. I, I'm, it... a, I'm become a, a lovable loser here, John Boy. I lose everything. I haven't no. won. <laughs> I did beat um Jake in uh Vino <clears throat> yesterday. And I beat Jolly. Stream. Oh so yeah, we had a electric. great day yesterday. We had Jam Boxing represented yesterday, Chris, in the Vino. We had a Vino stream at the office. Um, the John Boy Hot Boys were were representing. Oh, we Banner won. Day. All right, let me get to uh, – yeah, so saves 15% off when you order now by using uh, coupon code JOMBOY. Order your copy of Match 5 Trivia Game uh, today. Uh, this is a very fun game, and especially with the holidays coming up. Love Match 5. Some 320 cards, so you're it's going to take – unless you play for a very long time, you're not yeah. going to get any any repeats. Can I get my list? Oh, the, shit. You didn't yeah. give your list? Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, we matched a couple, but I, I had Rumble. I had Bout. That's good. Mm-hmm. Bout. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had Squabble. I don't, that's, that's, okay. that's, that's, that's the one, well, that's the one you thought I wasn't going to yeah. get. Clearly, I did. Uh, beat down, and then beat down. Fist of cuffs. Mm. Yeah. Donnie Brook. All right, so I so you heard. and I had you we we had two matching. Yeah. Ronnie, and then, and then you matched Dan. One with Dan. Yeah. So I win. Chris, you I made win. the most. Okay, you're the I made the most matches. Okay. I made the most matches. Chris, you're the world champ. We get it. Twenty and zero is a kickboxer. <laughs> all your belts are back go. there. I'm a. The this is why they're all up there, guys. Yeah, yeah. He's, Chris wins again. Yeah. All right, there we go. Our main portion of the show: myth busting. Boxing has so many myths. And shout out to everyone on Twitter that gave me some phenomenal answers. I had my uh, some. Chris put some in there as well. Um. We're basically just going to talk about some myths. We're either going to bust them or we're going to say that, you know, these are true. Uh, there are some great ones. So let's get it started. Um, you want me to read them out to you? I kind of have a different list. So oh, okay. okay. I will I will just read some and, and, uh, and Ronnie, feel free to, to uh, give your take on this too, because sure. they are some like pretty much mainstream type of boxing mm-hmm. myths. All right. Mm-hmm. Close rounds go to the champion, which I think is absurd. Like why are judges scoring fights with out an a versus b type of thing like if you're the champion and it's a close round oh, i'm gonna give it to the champ because he's got the belt that's ridiculous right chris yeah i mean you can speak on this better than anybody you're the objective numbers guy you're the guy you know who's going to be scoring fights and that's just not how it works There, there's no room for any kind of like feelings when it comes to scoring you're supposed to score each round of it as if it's its own contest regardless of who each fighter is the problem is that scoring is subjective and you have you have preconceived notions going into fights where it's like this guy's a big puncher and this guy's not and then so every punch he lands hurts more that but like you, you really shouldn't do that um you got to take it in every moment so having that idea having it even in your mind as a judge is going to make your your decision not fair yeah, um, judging is subjective, like you said. There are humans. Um, they hear the crowd. They, you know, they sometimes they don't see the action. I've sat pretty close to judges. Um, when I do CompuBox, I look at a monitor when I'm ringside. Crazy as that sounds, uh, because it's, it's better angles. But close rounds go to the champion is one of the most frustrating aspects of of boxing. We don't know for sure if if that's the case because we don't hear from the judges. <laughs> um, we don't get their rationale ever until they're you know uh retired and even then we don't hear too much from from judges but close rounds going to the champion is a myth uh that we have just busted because it's bs all right next one Fall- fallacy fallacy another big word uh professionals uh, professional boxers are required to register their hands as the resident professional boxer on this set here is this true because i've heard this forever it's ridiculous 
No, it is not true. Like you do have a, a, a boxing license. And this comes from the idea that you could be sued because your hands are, are considered weapons. It's not true. You could be civilly sued. If you have, you know, that, that's a whole different thing. You go to a case, have a civil case where they're like, this guy knows how to fight and used undue force to do extra damage that was Fixed completely my unnecessary. my ass at a bar in front of my girlfriend. Right. <laughs> And then, and then, you know, he didn't need to beat me up that bad, or you, you injure a guy like then there's somewhere where that could come into play being, but that has nothing to do with your hands being registered or licensed. Um, what a, here's a, a way around that a loophole, Chris, you're a kickboxer. You register your hands, but your feet what about my feet registered <laughs> and you go, you're going to get yourself into a bar fight and just kicking the shit out of a guy. Well, hey, listen, I was, I was a damn good wrestler in high school. And if, if I'm fighting one guy, I'm not punching you. I'm probably, I'm going to kick you and I'm going to dump you on your head. Oh. Because I'm not, I'm not hurting my hands on your face. Did you ever get into a bar room brawl? Ever? Yeah, a ton. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. Did they, and is this when you were like before you were a kickboxer, or while you were a kickboxer, while you were a boxer? Um, mostly while I was kickboxing, but yeah, it's been it's been a while. You know, I'm, I'm a I'm a 38 year old man. Well, I hope not <laughs> now. You're not getting into fights. <laughs> Can't get into street fights. I'm a world champion. I'm not getting into street fights. But, but I mean, like, uh, what I mean is, like, fighters. Like, I've heard this. Like, you've heard this too. This is also like another like myth out there. Like, or like an urban legend. Like when a, a fighter goes to a bar and like the toughest guy at the bar, like they don't like that they're there. Like, oh, you're not. Yeah. So tough. Like, oh, you think you're like I, I can take you, and then all of a sudden you're fucking fighting at the bar. Yeah, no, I I've had a lot of those situations, but when you're when you know how to fight and you fight all the time, the last thing you want to do when you're out is fight. And I I was never like I'm never like a hot headed guy. I've gotten into things because of people I'm around, you know, girlfriends, friends. You, you know, sometimes you just have to fight. That's just that's just reality. Um, but for the most part, if it if it was just me, I'm just fine either talking you out of it or getting myself out of the situation. It's it's never worth it. Too many too many things can go wrong. Must be annoying too to be the friend that's the fighter. Like if you guys get into a fight, it's like, oh, great. Algeria's got to get us out of it and just start. No, all my friends are tough. I didn't really didn't have that problem. All my friends are really tough guys. My best friends are like a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt, and we all wrestled together. Like we were all pretty tough kids. We didn't. I met your brother. Your really... brother's been in some fights. Yeah, my brother's a tough guy too. Like we, I... we, we. That was never an issue. It's like, oh, Chris got to come save the day. No, <laughs> I'm, probably, I'm, I'm, I'm saving the guy that my friend's beating up. Basically, Huntington guys, man, the Huntington, Long Island guys, I wouldn't mess with them. They fight. I tell people that all the time. People are like, oh, you're from Huntington, Long Island, from the suburbs. I'm like, yeah, but this is a fight town. People fight here. There's a lot of bars and a lot of fisticuffs. Like the thir- uh, Thanksgiving morning or every other oh, little town dude. is playing football. No, Huntington, they're just fist fighting. Fighting. Yeah, they're, they're coming back with bloody noses to, to eat turkey. All right, I got another myth here. Mike Tyson is an all-time great heavyweight. Uh, controversial. Yeah, but he, yeah, he is. He is for a number of reasons, and uh, not just based on his. I mean, listen, he's the youngest heavyweight champion of all time. Yes. So there, there's no argument. Yes, he is. He he he's an extremely extremely important uh, member of a very small class of of heavyweight champions. So yeah. yeah. Um, he's probably the second most famous boxer ever, behind mm-hmm. Muhammad Ali. He yep. is. At, he was at the UFC event. He got a massive ovation. He is probably one of the five most famous, recognizable faces. Um, obviously, he spawned a whole generation of fans. But I love Mike. Let me preface this. I love. He's one of my heroes. Like in, I interviewed him on this show, and it was a thrill. He. I don't know if I would place him in the top ten because. His he lost every big fight that he was in. Lost the Lennox Lewis, lost the Holyfield, obviously lost the Buster Douglas. Not counting those fights towards the end because that was just money grabs for him. Yeah, he also got oh. knocked out in all of those fights. Yes, yeah, people forget that conversation that people are always put Tyson in their top five of all time. I'm just like, oh, I mean, what are we looking at? Is it popularity or if we're going by all time great status? Like, there's so many other great heavyweights. Like, what would you say is Tyson's best win? <sighs> Um, tough Ty- question. <laughs> tough question. Um, my dad he, told me that people he, picked Sphinx before that fight. Uh, yeah, I mean that was massive, undefeated, and someone that you know. I, I don't know. I think Mike was probably the favorite in the fight, but still to blow him out in ninety seconds was was pretty wild. 
Um, I watched the uh, the Razor Ruddick fights the other night. Those are those are awesome. Yeah. But Razor Ruddick, very yeah, a very underrated fighter. Excellent fights, and um, you know those 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 are big wins. <sighs> you went the distance yeah. with um, Tony Tucker, uh, James Bone Crusher Smith was a really mm-hmm. tough fight for him. Like that broke up yep. the streak of knockouts for him. Um, but you know, this just shows like, obviously he's so popular and people love him. Like he's beloved. There's that's awesome. Yeah. Like he still resonates with fans even today. Um, but if you like really dissect his resume, he isn't that good. Well, it's like saying, it's like saying Floyd Mayweather's top five best fighters ever lived. That's he, another he's point. not, he's not, you know, like he, I don't care what you say about this. He's not, um, because the population of those guys, it's massive. There's a, there's a, incredible amount of super talented unbelievable fighters who have lived you know throughout the 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 history of boxing um so not having mike in your top five is totally fine you can still be one of the great greatest heavyweights top 20 greatest heavyweights are still still that's still one of the greatest heavyweights top 20 you know, is a lot it's a really it's like a hundred year old sport so if you're right. in the, you're in the top hundreds of, the of great champions yeah uh here's a fun one and this one i like this one abstaining from sex before a fight Helps you win. Chris Algieri, um, take it away. So <laughs> known sex to her. <clears throat> so I can tell you what the science says, and I can tell you what my personal experience is. So scientifically, the idea is that you're preserving your testosterone and you're keeping your, you know, your your man, your mm. you know, your testosterone, as my coach Keith Tremble used to always say. Well, like, oh, nice. How's your testosterone? <laughs> and it's freaking amazing. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, there's something to that, like, uh, power lifters will actually take ice and put it on their testicles to increase their testosterone momentarily. So that's something like, like having more testosterone in your body right before an event matters. So there's that now, does it really make that much of a difference in terms of like circulating blood testosterone and free testosterone? Probably not. I, a lot of it's mental and anything that gives you an edge mentally or not is an edge. So, uh, you know, if, if, if you feel like I used to always feel like that, I took time because I like having sex. I, it makes me more relaxed and calm. If I don't, if I abstain from it, I'm a nastier, meaner person. So for me going into a fight, it's good for me to be a nasty, meaner person. So it was that, that struggle, that, that, that sacrifice, that extra, uh, extra additional training discipline that helped me feel like I, I, I was going to go out there and, and, and give it my all and have that little bit of nastiness. Cause you know, a little, a little meanness can definitely help. A little extra meanness can help. So, with that being said, you did abstain. I did, I did, not for a super long period of time, but how long? Listen, when you're for a when you're a young man, I mean, two weeks is plenty. <laughs> two weeks, <laughs> ten days, ten days is a lot. Ten days, he's like <laughs> flipping tables. He's like yeah. snapping on like buffer. The, the Hulk. Yeah, he's ready to six, bust. Six, out seven, of- six, seven days. I'm, 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 I'm slamming this mic against the wall. So, ten, I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I'm ready. So that is a myth. So that is a be just yes, yeah. there's no science well, behind it. Tyson Fury said he was jacking off three times a day leading up to his three. fight with uh, seven. Yeah. What? Seven. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So seven. All right. Jelly seven legs times a day. Jelly legs. He's Fury calling in the ring. Just <laughs> loose as a goose. I think it's like a guy's so like relaxed. Rocky thing. Oh, it's like we can, well, women weaken legs rock. It's like it's like ridiculous. No, you know what yeah. weakens legs? Hanging out with women. Working your way up to getting laid is the is what tires those guys out when you're out and you're you're listen, you always stay out later than you than you oh, want to. Yes. Nothing good you happens. Know? It's one AM. No, exactly. When once that once that witching hour hits, it's it's time to go home and get your rest. And sleep is a big part of not only training and recovery, but your your testosterone. So if you're out chasing women women late and you get less sleep and you have to go in the gym in the morning, your testosterone is gonna drop. Scientifically, that's that's a fact. I abstain so, for it, recording this podcast. I want to be at my meanest. For how long? Um, forty-eight hours. Just this morning. <laughs> about about <laughs> seven that, hours. That's my my beautiful girlfriend. All right, here we go. Um, that was a fun one. Um, fighters from the past would beat this generation of fighters. I disagree. I think I think the I think they're probably tougher. Um, maybe to a degree, you know, like harder men just because of you know life back then but I, the guys now they're bigger they they know how to cut weight better supplementation training you know uh the other stuff that they can do they're just the progression of the sport and the skill level um yeah i don't i don't know and plus you know 
Scoring is different. The style's different. If you watch those guys fight, there's a lot of moving around each other, out throwing punches. Um, you can't do that anymore. I always see that about like Ali. Ali was backpedaling most of his fights. It, it would be really hard to win rounds fighting like Ali did now in a 12 rounder, the way he fought in a 15 rounder. So uh, I, I I disagree with that. It's like nostalgia. It's just like a nostalgia thing. It's like an yeah. era thing. Like our parent, our, our dads would be like, "There's no way that he would beat." You know, Sugar Ray will take down any of these guys. But that's just like it's your generation. You have pride for your generation. Yeah. But I guarantee, and Chris, you would know this. Like the fighters of today, sports medicine wise, nutrition wise, this goes for any sport. Are yeah. have more access now to like to becoming an elite top athlete. Then like freaking Babe Ruth smoking a cigarette, eating a freaking hot dog or like Mickey, yeah. Mantle, who was his body broke down when he was like 25. Like same thing with, with boxing. Like we the fighters of today have so much access to so many game changing things to give them that edge that, you know, that might allow like a, a fighter of, of today, like a like a, to one of today's top welterweights would be able to outclass a Sugar Ray Leonard. How about nutrition? You know, but back in like in the Joe Lewis days, like that was like depression era box. Like oh, those guys were like starving. Like Joe was eating steak. You know, Joe was strong. Joe was eating steak, and he was fighting guys who literally haven't eaten for a couple. You know, for for a couple days before they fight because they just they can't afford food. And they're waiting for that payday. Wow. You know, it's just it's it's a different, it's a completely different era. Uh, athletes are a different thing now. Um, I always talk to my friend, my friend of mine who's into really old school boxing, and we always bring up Ray Mercer. Dude, Ray Mercer would have given all of those old guy guys hell. Mercer. He was big. He hit hard. He had great chin. I mean, he would give guys today hell. But he's one of those guys I think crossover would be good in any era. Okay. Uh, punchers are not born. They're made. Is that a myth? Uh, uh, that's a myth. Yeah. Powers. <laughs> one, power. Especially one. Yeah. But, uh, you, no, no. Point, wait. What's it's Punchers are not born. Pun- they're made. Right. So I'm yeah, sorry, I, I said that way wrong. <laughs> Do okay. over. Punchers, punchers, are, punchers born, are born, not made. You're born with yeah. power, and you can't develop. Yes, it. you're. Uh, you can develop to a degree, but but the a true puncher is born. Wow, really? Oh. I thought it was gonna be the other oh, yeah. way. Mm-mm. I thought it could Mm-mm. be like like Tyson Fury wasn't a puncher. Um, there are a lot of theories for why he is now, but uh, Tyson Fury was not really known as a puncher, and then he hooks back up with uh, Sugar Hill Stewart, and he gains some extra pounds, technique, starts sitting down more in punches, and now he's knocking guys out left and right. Yeah, but like one punch, guys, you either got that or you don't. Like this, and there are some people that they can just crack. They don't look good doing it. They don't, they get, you know, they might get tired quick, but some people can just punch, yeah, and there's nothing you can do with that. It just is what it is. Arnie agrees. I agree. I mean, it can, like, I I can train for my entire life. I'll never be like any of these punchers. I, like, I can train like any sport. Like, it won't be LeBron James. Uh, well, in baseball too, like like I Justin Verlander, like he yeah. he has a rubber arm. Like he yeah. just throws ninety eight, ninety nine into his forties. Yeah. Nolan Ryan. Nolan Ryan. Like they, right. some guys are just born with that that ability to throw a ball. Some guys are born with that ability. There's a lot of fighters out there that could punch, but they couldn't really do any of the other things. Like they weren't mm-hmm. good at the other yeah. aspects, but they had that great equalizer, which is the great elixir in boxing, which is power. So that's interesting. I always thought like I thought you would go the other way on that, but imagine me training nope. my entire life to try to become Mike Tyson. Tim, are- Tim Bradley and I have spoken about this a bunch of times, and, my, and Tim brings it up on air. He's like, it's like I didn't have that power. Paulie Malignaggi is another one I've talked to about. It's like, listen, the guy he was never going to be a knockout puncher. You know, it's just it's just not the way. You, listen, doesn't mean you can't knock a guy out because I'm the first to say if you can hit a guy, you can hurt him. If you can hurt him, you can stop him. Okay. That's yeah. literally that's everybody. Yeah, if you can if you can hit him, you can hurt him. If you hurt him, you can stop him. So anybody can get a stop. Anybody can get a knockout. But like a true one punch puncher or, or knockout guy, you got that or you don't. There's uh, a there, there's a degree that you can get better based on technique and speed and conditioning, yeah. but you're you have a ceiling. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I agree there. You talked me into it. Uh, he's the next Mayweather. I hate when they do this. They're doing it today with Shakur Stevenson. Um, they do it with anyone who's slick. They do it with anyone uh, that has good defense. It's just not fair. It's not fair to these young guys. Stop doing it. Stop comparing them. They use our stats. 
and you know we can't stop them ESPN from from doing that. They try to compare Devin Haney or Shakur where they are now numbers wise to where Floyd was. Floyd was a completely different fighter at 135 than he was at 147. Stop comparing these young guys to Floyd. Yeah, no, it's not a fair comparison. But you know what? You know how I look at Floyd. You know what? You know what metric I think is the most important when you're looking at Floyd in his career? The dollar sign. <laughs> Highest paid athlete ever. That's 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 the real metric of what we should measure Floyd. Because, you know, his ability, it's like, you're going to be the next Floyd. It's like, what does that mean? You're going to have the best defense? Is that you're going to, you know, are you going to piss off everybody who watches you? <laughs> like, what, 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 what are you that's looking to be? The most money. Exactly. You know, it, like uh, me, the way I look at it, like, listen, I love Floyd. I think Floyd was a fantastic fighter. I love this technique. I think he had a lot of grit. He was way better than... um a lot of these new age guys like to say that he is. Um, but again, we spoke about it. Is he top five best, one of the best fighters we've ever seen? No, but he's the highest earner that we've ever seen and probably will be for a very long time. And that's, that's, that's awesome. So if you want to be the next Floyd, you better make some dollar bills. According to Daniel Cormier, um, he's the third best fighter of all time. Amanda. Stop. Stop. Khabib. 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 And Ali. I didn't even have Ali. No, Ali. Oh, did he? I don't want to think about his list. I don't want to get. Ali might have been. Yeah, that, that, shout that, out that to Ariel that... Hawani, who's my buddy. Who Ariel had him on his show, and <laughs> they told him to his face. That is the worst list I've ever seen. That list gives me a stomachache. Like just thinking about it, <laughs> I'm like horrible, Ugh. terrible. And he knows it. What he like? Ariel was 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 busting his balls pretty good. He's like, I know you're a company man. I know you work for ESPN now. That list was ass. It was. <laughs> um, next one. Um, this one is near and dear to me. CompuBox stats can tell you who won a fight. This nope. is the biggest myth <laughs> of them all. And I want Absolutely to not. debunk. I want to bust this myth right in his face. Pause. You're the man to do it. Put that on a shirt. CompuBox stats since day one, since their inception, February 16th, 1985, were meant for, this is my dad would always say, to the point where we would make fun of him for saying barometer. It's just a barometer of activity. Judges don't see it, which is another myth fans think. It has zero uh, play in who wins or loses the fight. It is zero playing scoring. Doesn't yeah, it doesn't see the score. The judges don't see the stats. The only people that see the stats are the broadcasters and the fans at home. It's a tool mostly for the broadcasters and research, um, which we send to all everyone out there. Um, but I will say this. I think we did a study a while back and it was like 80% of the time or even more. If you throw and land more punches than your opponent in a 12 round fight, you're most likely going to win. There are very few times where a guy was down um, on connects and they either won the fight, maybe because of bad judging or they landed that shot, you know, out of nowhere, like an Andy Lee shot at the garden that one time. But I'm debunking this. CompuBox stats do not tell you who won. Use well, you're your the best guy eyes. to to debunk it. So <laughs> use your eyes. I mean, yeah. and use use everything. That's what I always say. Like I use the numbers, <laughs> I use my eyes, and that's the best way to watch a fight, in my opinion. It's just an additional numbers for us. I think they are very useful. It's a tool. You know, you you, you, you described it perfectly. It's 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 a tool. It's it's um it's something that broadcasters use. Pro- I think the CompuBox does its best work and is most useful before a fight. When you're looking at past performances, um, you know, as this live action, like you said, the judges don't see it. Um, it doesn't matter. And even for us as broadcasters, like we don't look at it every round. We don't have that much time. You know, we have we're speaking live even in between rounds, like we're, we're talking to the truck. We're getting these numbers. We have replays to, to talk over. There's not a lot of time for us to sit there and analyze any kind of copy box information. So it's much better to use pre fight when you're talking oh, yeah. about past performances than, than anything else. Shout out to Lee Groves. He puts together the best pa- packages. And it, yeah, helps he's, he's out, it helps you he's figure kick-ass. out the, um, the database is so, so big. I mean, it's 35 years now. Um, more than that. Almost closing in on 40 years of every. Older than you. It is way. Yeah, it was incepted. In, it was brought into life two years before I was brought into life. But uh, the best thing is that it you can kind of figure out how the fight's going to play out. Or you at least have a, an idea beforehand when it comes to punches thrown. Um, this uh distribution of punches uh but yeah it, it really doesn't tell you who won um use your eyes uh ducking fighters are scared to fight each other that's a you can answer this were you ever afraid of a fighter no guys we get paid to fight 
we don't fight. We don't get paid. I say this all the time. It is never, it's not that fighters are fighters. We fight fighters. Got to fight at the highest level. Nobody, the guys are not scared. Listen, certain matchups are better than others, but uh, I don't, I don't have that mentality at all. I mean, it, it, the biggest fights pay the most, you know, the toughest fights pay the most, the hardest fights pay the most. So we listen, we want to get paid. We want to fight. We want to fight. And also we want to fight tough guys. You know, we, we, we all care about our legacy. I don't care who you are. So um yeah i i i i hate when i hear that from these casuals saying oh he's ducking him it's like hey, he dude he's not he's not ducking two million dollars you know it, we, yeah i hate it i hate the word ducking i believe that every fighter wants to fight the best um there are exceptions of course but i would say 99.8 percent of the time the fighter a wants to fight fighter b the best want to fight the best uh they're not scared or they wouldn't have got into this business to begin with i think what gets in the way is the promoters of course the you know the networks uh have gotten the way so many times of some of these big fights but as for fighters wanting to fight each other, i think they all want to fight each other they want to prove that they're the best why do you sacrifice everything give up so much in life spend your whole life training which is the, some of the hardest stuff out there just to to, to not want to fight the best and not see where you stand like I think it's ridiculous. So I think that's a big myth that fighters are ducking or fighters are scared. Fallacy. Uh, fallacy. Fallacy all the way through. The final two. Open scoring will improve fights. I hate open scoring. Where do you stand on it? I just made a face that makes that, uh, Have you ever terrible. fought in a fight that had open scoring? Uh, uh no. Nope. It's in today. I think Texas did it. They did it for a Canelo Lara fight. Where after the fourth round, they'll announce out to the audience in the arena what the score is, and then after the eighth round. So bad, bad idea. The reason I don't like it is because anything that encourages a fighter taking his foot off the gas, I think, should not be allowed in the sport. Right. So if you know you're up, um, you're gonna coast. So you're gonna fighters done this all the time, and it's bitten them in the ass, like Oscar De La Hoya <laughs> uh, versus Trinidad. <laughs> Turn he, out, yep. he thought he was up, and then he coasted for the final two three rounds, lost the fight. Like if you're and the other flip side of it, if you're a fighter, you know you're losing. Like you don't need to like be told that you're losing, and you can now you're gonna like step on the gas pedal. Like you should like I think open scoring is stupid. Uh, they're talking about it a lot in, in MMA, bringing it out. Um, I don't think it will improve fights at all. I don't think it will, it will improve scoring. Uh, these a lot of these judges don't have any shame or any conscious anyway. Um, I don't think they even tell you who has who up at the time. They just blurt it out. So listen, scoring needs to be fixed. I don't think open scoring is the way to do it. I don't think that that adds anything to it. And like you said, anything that's going to affect the outcome of a fight in that way and change how the way a fighter is going to fight is a bad idea. I coasted one time in a fight. I had the flu going into it. I fought, I fought in the garden and I was like, I'm going to fight as hard as I can. I'm going to try and get him out of there early. I'm going to fight as hard as I can. If I don't, then for the second half of the fight's going to be rough. Cause I was, I had a fever. I shouldn't have fought honestly, but I, I was like, whatever, I'm, I'm, I'm fighting. I had a fever the morning of the fight. I felt absolutely horrible. I'm hopping up green stuff. I fought my ass off for six rounds and I won the six rounds and I was pretty much, all right, well, I won the fight. <laughs> you, know, you won the six. That's ballsy or like, risky. I won the six and I was like, all right, I, I went forward for six rounds. It was very, very, I had put a very strong showing for six rounds. I was like, all right, I won the fight. I mean, I didn't lose all the other rounds. I probably lost two rounds the whole night, but still. I fought in a very different style and I was more holding on than anything. I just, I just had no, I've never been so tired of in a fight in my entire life. So you it basically, was, I, you equivalent to in people in the real world working a half day. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem is I'm still getting punched <laughs> the other half. Of the like day. I said, in, in the weirdest way possible, like some guys, yeah. pocket, they work a half. I put in my solid three hours of work and now I'm just going to, pretend i'm working look like i'm working this I, I looked at it and i was like i'm i put in the hardest work i can i got i got enough done my work day is done efficiency was good i got i did all the i got it all done that i need to get done uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna cruise a little bit because i i was i've literally never been so tired in any fight of my entire life it was absolutely horrible no, it's the closest chris algeri has ever come to working a, a real job like a nine to five he put in his solid six rounds and got his hand raised <laughs> that was your flu game I've literally, yeah, I was my flu game. I've literally never had a job. Like, I never, I never had a nine to five. So, no. No, no, just kidding. No. He's your yeah, adjunct professor, promoter for that one, well, that one time. Um, what else? Uh, I mean, I've had, I've had a lot of jobs, but I've never had like a, a traditional nine to five. Like a traditional going, yeah. clock in. Yeah. I had I mean, insurance probably, once. That was cool. 
you sold insurance once? No, I had I had insurance one time, one of my jobs. Nice. Yeah. We have benefits here, John Boy. Cool. Yeah. Final myth. And I saved this one for last. Of course, because it's the final one. That boxing is dead. You can't kill the know. sport, folks. Larry Merchant said it best. Nothing will no. save it and nothing will kill it. It's fighting. Boxing is it's it's immortal. It's immortal. It's eternal. It's as it's it's as old as that. That's that's what you know, it, it, listen, what it does to people, why you want to see it. When there's a fist fight outside, you want to see it. Everyone wants to fight. Everybody likes to watch a fight. It's a, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's beautiful violence. We all, we all love it. It's an art. It's, it's something that will never go away. Like you said, um, listen, four months ago, you, we were saying boxing is having the best year it's had in a long time. Granted, we shot ourselves in the foot as boxing tends to do. It gives us self black eyes, but it'll come back next year. will be another great ebbs year. And and ebbs and flows, man. We ebbs and flows. That's it. A long time. I've been following the sport for a long time. It, good, good months, bad months. Overall. That's why you're, that's why you're Danny optimistic. Danny MMA, Danny optimistic. It has been a good year. I'm our year end show. I will illustrate that. But you know, Max Kellerman said this best once. He said, you go to a uh, New York city street or a city street and there's four corners. And in one corner, they're playing stickball. The other corner, they're playing flag football. The other corner, they're playing basketball. Fourth corner, there's a fight. Where are all the people going to gravitate towards to? And it's Fourth probably corner. the fight. Like, people yeah. just, like, love watching fights. And like you said, nothing's going to kill the sport. Nothing's going to uh, help it. It's just, it is, it's going to be here. And there's going to be ebbs and flows. Hopefully, we get the fights that we want to see. Uh, hopefully, there's still an interest in it. And that's it. It's just going to be around forever. And uh, that's that. So that that myth, I've been hearing that it's boxing dead since, what, the ni- early 90s? When, well, I think it started when Ali retired. And then it, then along comes Sugar Ray Leonard and the Four Kings. Yeah, the Four Kings. Yeah, okay. Along and then comes then Mike Tyson, Tyson, Jones, Oscar De La Hoya era. La Hoya, Floyd Mayweather, Manny Pacquiao. Uh, Canelo. Canelo. Now we have this era. All these young, young guns. Hope they're not really fighting each other. But there's so much talent in the sport right now. And it, it, I said this when I was with watching at the UFC event with with these UFC guys, the MMA guys. I said if there was a centralized league in boxing right now, the amount of talent, 10, 15 deep in every division, and every week there would be an event like this UFC 281 for boxing. That's how much talent is in the sport, and it would be. It would the sport would rise to the to the top because there's that much talent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen. You talk to those MMA guys about boxing; they all love boxing. Dana White loves boxing. Like it's not. It's it's just it's inherent, and you know it's 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 a version of boxing. This is something I've always got. People are like, well, you are a world champion kickboxer. You went to boxing. Well, why didn't you go to MMA? And my I always said, well, I wanted I didn't want to add weapons and dilute my skill set. I wanted to take away weapons and focus so I could be a master of what two weapons I had. So, and that's what boxing is. It's, it's this focused and diluted version, uh, not diluted, uh, focused and, and, um, centralized. Se- yes. Like, yeah. It's, I mean, focus centralized. Uh, I'm, t- I'm trying to think of the, of the cooking term where you cook something down. Um, Oiled. but, uh, Fauteed, filleted, <laughs> fried. <laughs> You're the cook, Fighters Kitchen. I know, I know. I'm trying, I'm trying to play. Right, it's so been a long show. We'll, we'll get it. We'll get it in the in the in the comments. Also, uh, I got to pee. I got to pee really bad, so it's hard to think. Um, all right, yeah, that's a good place to stop. Uh, that was all of our myths. <laughs> I know you're getting that. Um, that was a fun one. Thank you, everybody. We'll be back next week um, with our Thanksgiving episode. Uh, uh, Chan Cepeda versus Regis Progre. Dillian White's in action next week. We will preview that and much more. Signing off from our beautiful warehouse in Jersey City. Protect yourselves at all times. Keep your hands up and stay out of those DMs. See you next